Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Sajan already introduced me. I'm a postgraduate student at the University of Nottingham. And uh, I'm in my final year. I'm writing up my thesis. So I'd like to present my research project today and to have a discussion with you. Um, my research can briefly be summarized in a question. Do corruption scandals matter? And if they do, in what sense and to what extent? Uh, my research is uh, related to corruption scandals in Serbia, uh, the scandals that surfaced from 2000 to 2010. And uh, uh, actually, it was motivated by two current tendencies in uh, modern pol uh, Serbian politics. One is that uh, in the past 10 years, there have been over 50 anti-corruption institutions established, uh, laws introduced, committees. And uh, on the other hand, we see on the media, on a daily basis, reports about corruption and corruption scandals. I can't give you an exact, exact number of corruption scandals because it's difficult to, to identify them and we can talk about it later. But I notice that both tendencies are actually related to the same phenomenon but somewhat inconsistent. And I wondered if these two phenomena are related and in, in what sense. So my idea was to explore Possible, possible causal relation between these courts and the structures or the institutions, and if high-level corruption scandals might have caused some institutional change. Um, another direction in which my research is going is to explore the nature of discourse. So I'm looking at anti-corruption discourse in Serbia over 10 years and how corruption has been conceived and perceived by elites and also by the public. Um, so far in political science, there is a um, wide debate about whether the structure is actually what determines and conditions the debates, or whether the discourse can change this, uh, the structure. And my theory that I actually use in my research is discursive institutionalism. Uh, it's been articulated and published lately in 2010 by Vivian Schmidt, and it argues actually for return of ideas into politics, into political uh, analysis. It's a wide uh, theoretical platform and it, clu it includes both one extreme of um, theoretical analysis in politics, which is historical institutionalism, which argues that actually actors are just minor um, in, in uh, historical change and actually institutions appear and reappear according to historical path. But um, uh, on the other hand, there is uh, insistence that actors are those who bring change and uh, they act rationally and uh, they bring uh, rational choices. But discursive institutionalism uh, includes both views but actually brings discourse as the main tool of change. And discourse in this theory is identified both as a content, a set of ideas, and also a set of communicated te uh, techniques, so the ways that the, those ideas are communicated. Uh, what Schmidt defines um, very relative and very important for, for um, analysis of discourse is that there are two spheres. So one is the policy sphere, where political actors coordinate their action and they develop coordinated discourse. So they think about the major problems in a society and how to deal with them. And the other sphere is a politics sphere, and that's where the communicative discourse develops between the political elite and the public. So how the political actors communicate to the audience what they're going to do about a certain problem. Another very important issue within the theory that could help you understand my, my presentation is that Schmidt argues that each discourse is actually based on three main points or three aspects. One is that the creators of the discourse want to create their own identity. So it's identity building. And that's what she calls the being. Then the actors have to do something to prove that they are who they say they are. And that's the doing part, what the politicians do actually about corruption. And then the third part is the saying, that's the communication. So if the political actors don't communicate what they coordinated between themselves, it can be very risky that their policies will succeed. And within this theory, I think there is a space for some innovations and additions, especially that Schmidt tested it, the theory on the Western developed democracies, but not on a transitional democracy such as Serbia. So I think that 
there will be room for, for improvement in uh, this sense, theoretically. Uh, practically, empirically, I test the theory and I analyze the case of Serbia as a case study. So I observe the discourse over 10 years. And uh, I operationalized the discourse uh, in form of corruption scandals. So I had to choose my case studies. And uh, in the academic world, in the West at least, corruption scandal is understood as uh, the most mentioned story in the media that contains certain words that we can choose, such as corruption, embezzlement, bribe, etc. But um, that definition actually didn't help me identify the case studies here because it's very difficult to find media coverage or coherent databases with information that I could search, actually. So I introduced some qualitative criteria for, my, for this case, for my research, and we can talk about it later, but briefly I will just tell you what cases I got as a result of my testing and analysis of the discourse and the media. Uh, I chose uh, six scandals because there are three governments within 10 years and I decided to choose two scandals per government. So the first ones will be the money from Cyprus and Yugoremedia, privatization of Yugoremedia, then the privatization of Sartid and Tse Market, and then the port of Belgrade and the pharmaceutical scandal in 2010. Um, as I say, my, my uh, research goes in two directions, so trying to establish causality and observing uh, nature or change of, of, of the perception of corruption. And um, today I will present the first case, and uh, that was actually the story about the money from Cyprus. And before I start, I'd like to say, just to hedge my argument, that when I say corruption scandal, I don't imply that there is corruption there because I'm not doing an investigation, I'm just researching the story about it. So many people that I interview say that story from, about uh, money from, uh, from Cyprus is actually not about corruption. It's not, there is no corruption there, they said. I'm not trying to establish that as a truth, but I'm just um, looking at how the media and the political elite and um, intellectual elite as well presented that story and how, what impact it had on public perception and institutional change, of course. So the money from Cyprus is one of the first stories that surfaced in Serbia in public debates uh, soon after the change of government in 2000. And uh, it was a, a story about related to the previous government and the scheme of financial transfers from Serbia abroad. So it was in the 1990s when Serbia was Yugoslavia was under international sanctions and uh, no international financial um, transfers were legally possible. So it's um, allegedly huge amount of money transferred abroad to enable the government then to buy food, to buy, provide for other needs for the population and according to ICTY uh, within the uh, indictment for Milosevic certain amount of that money was also used to finance uh, armed conflict in the region. But in my research, I don't focus on that part. I'm interested in what individual businessmen, uh, actually, their role in, in the transfer. Um, just to give you a, a broad picture about the amount of money, uh, it's allegedly 11.5 billion of dollars that has been transferred abroad. That money wasn't in Serbia anymore, and. I don't know if it is now, but it's assumed to be in Cyprus because the previous government, Milosevic's government in the 1990s, had strong relations with the banks in Cyprus, Russia and Switzerland. Um, though that amount is, was very uh, big money, especially that uh, it almost equals to the uh, Serbia's GDP in 2001. So you can imagine that when the new political elite came into power, it was a, a very important case for them with uh, several reasons. So one is that financial, that the devastated economy after 2000 would really benefit from that amount of money and the privatization would go smoother probably. So they did insist to bring the money back. Another reason is to prove that the justice can be done actually, that the society and people deserves to, give the, uh, to get their money back because most of that amount was actually uh, citizen savings from their bank accounts. 
And the third point that is my opinion is that the new elite actually had uh, to, wanted to use the opportunity to show that they are who they say they are. As we say, this could be a very good proof of the doing part. And the case was presented by a political elite in a very uh, pompous way. So it was announced even before the elections were officially accepted. And uh, we can see that, that the new DOS coalition included symbolically this, this mission, this election, into their uh, uh, election uh, campaign saying that the money will be brought back. And very soon after the change, some political leaders got their mission or they were uh, appointed to lead the, the investigation. Um, briefly, um, the, the then governor of the National Bank, Mladen Dinkic, was appointed to be a head of the mission. He made a team of experts and uh, they very soon went to Cyprus, established contact with, the, with their counterparts there, uh, started investigating and um, also the government um, established a committee for investigation of malfeasance since 1989 to 2000, which is one of those 50 institutions established. And um, actually it was the doing part very well, almost obvious, that the elite was doing something. So my case, or what makes me think of this story as a scandal, is not the money laundry part and not the investigation, what brings the character of, of the scandal to this story is actually the moment when the governor stopped talking about the investigation. So um, it, it builds upon the previous presentation about uh, institutions that don't respond, that are silent, but in this theory it would be like a technique of silence. So without giving any information about what's going on, about the coordinated discourse, is actually what makes this scandalous. And uh, I can read some uh, words of the uh, of the gov governor who came back from from Cyprus already in 2001 in March, and he said, "We identify the bank accounts. We identify the name. We know when the transaction took place. We also know the exact amount of money. But we don't know, want to make this information public yet because we are waiting to Cypriot authorities to reply next week to the additional bring the additional documents that we had sent to them." So it was just a matter of time, and it was March 2001. But after that, um, media don't report about the case at all. And instead of direct explanation from the governor or other political actors, what we get is actually interpretation of the media about the case, about what happened or could have happened. So only in 2007, in one investigative journalist uh, program, the governor gave his own explanation. But as we said, it was rather too late in 2007 to explain what happened in 2001, but the governor said, at the end of 2001, I literally stopped trying to do any serious investigation. My enthusiasm lasted about a year, but afterwards I realized, I said to myself, you can't do it. And the journalist asked, did you have the right to give up? It wasn't your private investigation after all. And he said, I didn't give up. I gave up. I admitted to myself that I couldn't do it. There are moments when you say to yourself, you can't do it, nobody can. The issue was beyond my capacities, beyond my abilities. So we have this explanation as one possible, as I say, maybe too late. And there are many other arguments that prove that uh, the money laundering scheme was so developed and so protected that maybe some actors, no matter how strong their discourse was, couldn't actually do much about it. So even the ICTY expert said, Morten Torkinson, he said, in my career I have never encountered or heard of any offshore finance structure this large and intricate. I consider that to con conduct an overall and comprehensive analysis of what happened to all of the funds that was deposited or transferred into the bank accounts uh, on, of the eight Cypriot companies would almost be impossible and would be an extreme resource intensive exercise. So we can see that uh, the governor did face very serious obstacles, structural ob obstacles, but also there is an external actor such as uh, Cypriot authorities. And um, if you remember that at that time, 2001, 2 and 3, Cyprus had a very important thing to do, and that's the EU accession. So actually they didn't really like to reopen cases that wouldn't benefit that, that process. And even more, 
the president of Cyprus in 2003, Tarsus Papadopoulos, was actually the lawyer employed in the company, lawyer company, directly contacted with Milosevic and his uh, government in this scheme. So there, there, we can assume that that was also a, a problem, an obstacle in investigation. And uh, the third argument that was given by the media, that I find in the media coverage, is that actually the governor himself had uh, personal reasons to quit, to stop. So whether it is because he couldn't go, go further or because he got some benefits, but what we can see is that he's still in politics, even in the current government, and that he was never summoned to the court for what happened then. So actually he got away without answering the public what happened then. Uh, what's relevant for my research is that how this silence impacted public opinion or enthusiasm about the change that happened in 2000. And another thing very important for the scandal is that it was reopened several times. And this is not specific only for this case. Many cases don't have judicial ending at the court, so they can be reopened by political elites and media elites whenever it suits them or whenever somebody enthusiastically starts uh, investigation again. So money from Cyprus was reopened later and investigated by private businessman. Uh, he ran his private investigation, Pedro Georgic from, from Cyprus. Then there was a uh, London-based company, Forensic Investigative Associates. They worked with the National Bank. Then Vladimir uh, Ilyich, a uh, Serbian politician, he tried to reopen the case. Then Vladan Batic, it was all in 2002 and 2003, in that span of time. Vladan Batic, the then Minister of, of Justice. So the last moment when some serious contacts were made with Cypriot counterpart was in 2006 when the Serbian President Tadic talked to uh, Cypriot President Papadopoulos. And actually the contact was very courteous and they both agreed that actually that wasn't possible, that Cypri uh, Cypriot institutions are democratic enough that they wouldn't allow such thing to happen. And Tadic answered that he really believes that Cypriot institutions are very democratic. So the money simply disappeared and the Greek, the Cypriot uh, press reported that Papadopoulos' statements were false and Tadic's nebulous. So this is what the media thought about their reconciliation. But there is also another change, institutional change at this, this point, and that's uh, in 2006 when two people were investigated. One was uh, Mikhail Kertes, who was a long-term director of customs and very much involved in the money laundering 1990s. And he was also involved in some other illegal activities during the 90s. So he was brought to the court and he was sentenced to eight years in prison while the other person, Borka Vucic, who was uh, manager of the Serbian bank, involved in the uh, financial transfer, she wasn't sentenced or prosecuted. She, as a member of Socialist Party, became an MP. She had an immunity and she simply wasn't investigated, but she died in a car accident in 2009. Uh, what's interesting here is that we see another institutional change, definitely. and. Uh, we can see that in their defense, these two people actually represent the group of people who were involved in, in uh, money laundry, but they present corruption as something completely different. Uh, I can read just a statement of Mikhail Kertes at the, at the court. And he said, I'm not guilty and I do not admit the crime that I'm accused of. I was only implementing the policy that kept the state of Serbia functioning. This trial is politically motivated. The prosecutor did not mention that it was the time of embargo when nothing in this country could work normally. I'm not ashamed of what I was doing back then. On the contrary, I'm proud of it. This is a trial of the regime that was struggling to protect its borders in which, uh, and which dared to oppose the architect of the new order when they tried to change the borders of Serbia. I am the only living representative of that regime, and this is the only reason why I'm here. My trial is at the same time a trial to the dead Milosevic. People loved me. They adored me because I was bringing them money. As a matter of fact, it wasn't me that they loved. It was the money. So it was the news in Glass in September 2007. So 
what I see here is actually that we have two groups of actors and that Curtis or the previous political elite thinks or perceives corruption as national betrayal. So they think that the act was not only legal and in compliance with the then existing laws, but also it was a patriotic act, which implies that their ideas in their discourse are actually um, that is, the role of the state and politicians is to provide for the nation and to defend um, state, statehood or state sovereignty. While well, after 2000, when he was actually sentenced, the definition of corruption was different, and it was the, the one introduced with uh, good governance in 2000, which is abuse of uh, public money for private gain. So if this definition is applied to the uh, developments in the past, it was very helpful for the new elite to delegitimize the previous regime and to bring them uh, maybe not uh, to be not uh, efficient in uh, judicial terms but to help creating new memories and uh, uh, to legitimize themselves as the right ones also to delegitimize nation nationalism as a tool for political action and uh, as I say, uh, as I said, that my that my research goes in two directions. The causality in this case, in particular, is not very obvious. So I would argue that uh, discourse, anti-corruption discourse in early 2000, had a very low transformative potential, because the institutions that occurred simply disappeared. The commission that was founded, the head of the commission, was faced with a, a sexual harassment uh, scandal very soon. Uh, when, the, when he was appointed. His uh, secretary in the commission, he simply resigned because he said, I can't be a secretary in your office, in an institution uh, such as this one. It's completely inefficient. Uh, we see that the initial, initial idea to return the money, then later narrower to the taxing the rich people. So when the political elite realized that whole money could not be returned, um, the law was introduced, the law on extra profit, which meant that rich people will be taxed and that taxation will just replace return of the money. But even that law was manipulated or not implied properly and I can even read you the words of the <coughs> Minister of Finance who said about the, the law and how it was actually not, not applied properly. It was uh, Boži Darjevic, Minister of Economy, he said about the law. He said, well, you know how it, how it goes. It's not that someone gives you a ring and says, hey, listen, can you reduce the tax to this guy? What they do is they say, look, our party would like to vote for the budget, but one of our distinguished party members has problems with the revenue office about the extra profit. What I say to them, okay, I'll go to the media and I will tell them everything. Um, this just proves how openly politi politicians in Serbia talk about corruption and about the pressures that they face. But for me, it's very imp important to see that not even this institution worked. So the scope of the institution reduced. This law didn't work. It was abolished in 2002 after only one year. And what happened later was that actually the money from Cyprus, from other banks abroad, did return to the country, but through privatizations and, as it was already mentioned today, without checking the origin of the money in privatization, it could have been easy, easier this money, actually, that was taken out. Um, institutional effects of the discourse are not really good. Uh, they're not effective, uh, and uh, I can't claim that actually the discourse caused institutions in anti-corruption sector or in any other sector. But what I see here is actually that potential to create uh, memories and to change uh, very sharply the perception of corruption in the country, which will later stay as, as an official definition, and this is what will be measured partially in uh, perception index and... Um, <coughs> When people talk about corruption nowadays, they mean corruption is uh, misuse of public power for, for political gain and not the previous one. Um, this is just briefly my, my research and um, I analyzed the discourse in many tables here so we can talk more about the bits that you're more interested in 
or about the methodology. But uh, so far, I I think I said the main main issues. The thank you.